folks of multiple integrals. There is nothing technically new in this lecture, but I need to introduce these multiple integrals and show you how to take them. It's not too hard, just one to the front of the other, but it's prerequisite for any serious quantum mechanics and any serious computation model, because we need a three-dimensional model. And so our relation will be taking averages and other integrals over three-dimensional volumes. And so you need to be able to take integrals in dimensions greater than one. And there are two lectures about this. One is integration in Cartesian coordinates, that's today. That's your standard lecture x, y, z. And the next lecture, next week, will be about integration in various curvy linear coordinates. All are spherical, cylindrical, because systems can often have various types of symmetries, and coordinate systems can adapt to those symmetries. Equations simplify rather a lot, and then we will put all of that to good use when we do um, the full um, derivation of the hydrogen atom. Uh, a couple of lectures from now. Okay, so multiple integration is actually quite simple, much like partial differentiation when you differentiate with respect to only one variable and treat the rest of them as constants. Uh, partial integration is exactly the same. You treat everything else as a constant. So a simple example, if you are integrating some x cosine y dx, this is an integral with respect to x only. So any other variable is just a constant it's taken out of the integral, and then we can integrate. So we go from 0 to 1. And we can take cosine out of the integral cosine y, integral of 0 to 1, x. Yes, you know how to take that, right? x squared over 2 between 1 and 0, so that is 1 half, at least 1 half cosine y. So if you are given a definite integral with respect to one of the variables, approach it as if all other variables were constants, unless they are explicitly specified as depending on x. Now, if you have multiple integrals like that, you just do that repeatedly, but remember, when you have indefinite integrals, you have to have those constants, and these constants will proliferate. So let me give you an example of that. If we have a triple integral, x, dx, dy, dz, a form like that, conventionally means that you take the inner integral first, so you take x dx, then you will obtain some other expression, and you take the next integral, so this one, it will be with respect to dy, and then finally you take the outside integral with respect to z. So let us do it. We have double integral, and then integral x dx is x squared over 2 plus a constant. And we will call that constant c1, because there will be more constants, and then dy dz. The next integral we take is y. This is a constant, so far as y is concerned, and so is that. Remember that an integral of a constant dy is y. So what we will have here, integral, then x squared y over 2 plus c1y plus another constant c2. Is that? So notice now that this was a constant, it's now a legitimate constant with respect to the other integral, and so an integral of a constant is a constant times a y plus another constant. And then when we finally take the integral of this with respect to z, exactly the same happens, x squared y z over 2 plus c1 y z plus c2 z plus c2. Every time you take an indefinite integral, another constant comes up. And then, of course, if we differentiate this back, first with respect to z, then with respect to y, then with respect to x, we will get our x. <coughs> Notice that this expression actually depends on the order of integration. If 
we took integrals in a different order, we would get a different expression here. And so it is important to take the conventional term. Now, there is another convention for writing multiple integrals, and that is what's called an operator convention. It treats an integration process as an operator and writes it as such. So, for example, if we have an integral from 1 to 2 um, x, and then another integral from 0 to 1 x, y, Y. So this is written in the form that I have shown you here, right? We first take the inner integral from 0 to 1, and then we take the outer integral. Another way of writing this is as follows. This is usually used in various physics textbooks. Integral from 1 to 2 dy. Integral from 0 to 1 dx acting on x, y. Notice that whatever occurred under the integral is now here. And what this expression tells us is, first, we must apply this operator. And this tells us that this must be integrated with respect to x from 0 to 1. And then we must apply this operator, which means whatever comes out of this process must again be integrated with respect to y from 1 to 2. So this is math and this is physics. You will see both forms repeatedly and in fact when the second year senatore is the first year C quantum mechanics, I have the impression Marina is just switching um, randomly between the two notations uh, because uh, you kind of get so used to it that um, it becomes natural after a while. Uh, but you will have plenty of practice with this with the workshops. Now, let's go through a few examples of taking them just so that I illustrate the procedure and um, you see how that is done on a couple of examples. And I managed actually to tune the camera to filter out high frequencies so the screeching of the board doesn't come through in the video, which is very really good. Okay, so, example. Integral from 1 to 2 dy integral from 0 to 1 dx being applied to xy equals. Okay, if we integrate that with respect to x, it will be x squared y over 2, so integral from 0 to 2, and then x squared y over 2 from newton leibniz formula 0 to 1 with respect to x. And then it's still an integral y, so integral 1 to 2. The content of the bracket is this expression for x equals 1, so y over 2, minus this expression for x equals 0, minus 0, dy, and then another integral, so this will be y squared over 4, or from 1 to 2, so that is at the upper limit, 4 over 4, so minus, and then the lower limit 1, so 1 over 4, and that is C quarters, and I think that, that, that's right in the handout. This is the case where the limits are explicit in that they are actually numbers. If we look at the region of integration for this, the region will be square. So in the xy plane, our one x variable, y variable, and whatever else is in there, that will be our f. But y goes from 1 to 2, so from somewhere here to somewhere here, and then x goes from 0 to 1, so from here to there, and if we draw the corresponding region, 
that this is the area <coughs> we are integrating, and there's some kind of surface over it, and the integral is the volume that the surface makes with the x-y plane. Of course, the region of integration needn't be square. We can, for example, say that we've got two arbitrary curves, a curve like that um, and a curve like this, and we would like to have an integral over that. And of course, with respect to x, this will be, for example, from one half to three halves. So it will be an integral from one half to three halves dx. But with respect to y, it will be an integral from x squared to x. And so actually the limits of the previous integral can sometimes depend on the integration variable of the subsequent integral. That simply means that you are integrating over some axiomatic domain, which is square. So let's go through an example of that. Uh, it will be an integral minus 3 to 3 dy, and then an integral from y to the minus 4 5 of some <coughs> y um, dx. So here I'm using mixed notation. So notice that the inner integral is just the usual integral that you are used to, written as your school textbook did it, but the outer integral is an operator. It says, okay, do that, and then integrate the result with respect to y. Let us now look at what the region of integration here actually is. Uh, the, the flat plane, that's x, that's y, and our y is being scanned from minus 3 to 3. 3 here, 3 there. At the same time, x is being scanned from 5, so let's say 2, 5. 5, that's the right hand limit for this. From y squared minus 4. So that is x equals y squared minus 4, which means if that is that, so it's like that. So that is minus 4, and then it's a parabola, and so we are integrating from minus 3 to 3 with respect to y, and then from that parabola to that straight line, and so our integration region is this. So rather fancy, and you will have some practice in your workshops with how to draw these integration regions and how to interpret them. So for example, this is some uh, metallic shape, then an integral like that might just be the total mass of some complicated density distribution in three-dimensional space, and of course the function that depends on it will be formed um, over the board somehow. But let's take that integral, um, just simply take the sequence Get on with it. Okay, so integrating that with respect to x, so it's still the integral minus 3 to 3 dy acting on x squared over 2 plus 2y x, and this is in the limits of y squared minus 4 to 5 with respect to x. So now we are substituting x equals 5 on the upper limit, and x equals y squared minus 4 on the lower limit. Integral minus 3 to 3, 2, 1, 4. So on the upper limit, 25 halves plus 2 um, times 5 times y minus 
this goes in, so y squared minus 4 squared over 2 minus 2y and then y squared minus 4. This is the integral with respect to just y. It's a polynomial, so you open these brackets, you open these brackets, you integrate each term with respect to y, you substitute these limits, so at this point this is a technical method of angle, and the final answer is 2 pi So essentially, when faced with a multiple integral, even when the limits do depend on the subsequent variable, here, not just integrated bluntly um, as you normally would, substitute the limits, however complicated. Um, simplify, regroup, integrate again, simplify, regroup, integrate again. Um, the only thing this takes is practice. Um, and uh, integral in two dimensions is defined in exactly the same way as integral in one dimension, except when you do the Riemann sum, the Riemann sum is all more little volumes rather than the little areas. But Ultimately, it's exactly the same thing. Okay, so let's <coughs> take a look at a couple more of these integration rates uh, in two and three dimensions. Um, an integral like that, 0 to 4 dy integral y to 10 minus y dx applied to some f xy and the job here is to sketch the integration domain to illustrate how um, this region over which we are integrating this unfortunate function actually looks. So taking the graph x y and let's see y goes from 0 to 4 so from here to here and then x goes from y to 10 minus y. So one curve is x equals y. And the other curve is, is it x equals 10 minus y. So we need to plot both of these. And x equals y is simple enough. And then, so that's not four. 10 minus y at 4, it will be 6. So here, y equals 10 minus x. So at 4, this is equal to 6. So here somewhere, at 0, it is equal to 10. So over there, so it's kind of dropping down. And our integration is from 0 to 4, so the lower limit is 0, the upper limit is 4, and therefore the integration now proceeds, okay, so from 0 to 4, and then from this curve to that curve. So the integration is over this shaded area. y goes from 0 to 4, and x goes from x equals y to x equals 10 minus y. From that curve to that curve. So this trapezium is actually what the integration is getting over. Another example, integral from 0 to, from 1 to 2, this time dx. So here the outer integral was dy, there the outer integral is dx, and then from x squared to x plus 9, again the function f of x, y, dy. In this case, x goes from 1 to 2, 1, 2, x, y, and y goes from x squared, so let me just move this one in here, more proportional location. So if we draw the y equals x squared, we will see something like that. Now, 
and then x plus 9 is a straight line, uh, has been elevated by 9, so it's there somewhere, like this, and it intersects it somewhere. So, x from 1 to 2, so vertical line 1, vertical line 2, not drawing to scale here, I think the straight line is actually somewhat higher. Uh, and then y goes from the x squared to x plus 9, and so the region of integration would be this one. Uh, and you've got uh, a slightly neater curve. I think this um, little intersection happens over here, so the cut is actually. So that here would be the integration line. This, is get, this gets a bit more complicated in three dimensions, as you can imagine. So let us now look at the first case where we have a triple integral. Say an integral from 0 to 1 dx, an integral from 0 to 1 minus x y and an integral from 0 to 1 minus x minus y dz of some function x, y, z. This integral is given to us actually implicitly. So in your handout, you are asked the following. You are asked to integrate this over the volume that is bounded by three Cartesian planes and by a certain triangle. So if we look through the problem formulation in there, it will allow us to actually draw the integration domain. And this, I'm afraid, is where you will need a friend from the Winchester School of Arts, because um, a certain amount of skill is required in drawing. OK, if that's x, that's y, and that's Said, we are told that our integration region is bounded by the three Cartesian planes and the triangle, which is defined by the points 1, 0, 0, which is here, uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, so that is there, and then 1, 0, 0, 1. So this triangle here. And the three Cartesian planes. As you can see, it's a pyramid. So the xz plane is this. The zy plane is that. So behind there somewhere. Uh, then the xy plane is the bottom. And finally, we have um, this triangle that we've got. So this triangular volume that is bounded by the three Cartesian planes and this link on top of it is what we are integrating over. Now let's see how the limits of that integral actually come out of this. Well, clearly x is being integrated from 0 to 1 because that is 0 and that is 1. So we are scanning x from here to here. However, when we are looking at how y depends on it, when we start integrating with respect to y at every point, so we move there, 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 we go from 0 to this line here. That line here is y equals 1, one minus x. And so the second integral there is from 0 to 1 minus x. And then, of course, at every point here, 1, 3, Scan the x and scan the y, then every point we must scan the z all the way until it intersects with this triangle. So we must move up at each point. And that goes from 0, so that goes from 0, it's the z y plane, all the way to the triangle, and the equation for this triangular plane is z equals 1 minus x minus y. And so then we move along x, then we move along y, then z, 
and this is how this integral is constructed. Notice that the limits of the inner integral depend on the variables that will be integrated later, and this has x in the limit, and finally it will be integrated over x. So, every such line scanned along y, and the result of that is scanned along x. This is how you construct a trivial integral. And when the volume is defined to you, not in mathematical expressions, but in ge geometry, it says, OK, we want the volume imposed by that and that and that and that. That's called an implicitly defined volume. It takes a considerable amount of practice to get used to them. So let me give you two more examples of how implicitly defined volumes are analyzed. So example uh, three, I think, or four, says integrate f of f equals x squared plus y squared over the area bounded by the two axes, so x axis, y axis, and triangle with corners, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 1. OK, let's think about what that is going to be. Well, we clearly have that point, that point, and that point. So over this triangle, we have to integrate some function, which will be our z axis. So we draw the Cartesian plane again. This is our f. This is x. This is y. And then we need to approximately draw uh, what uh, we aim to integrate. So, just a little cube in here. So, that's our Cartesian volume. If you look at the function itself, it's a paraboloid. For every fixed x, it's a parabola with respect to y, and for every fixed y, it's a parabola with respect to x, so it's got point here, point here, point here, point there, and it has a circle. Then it has a zero and zero, so that goes down here, and there we are. So then So that's our <coughs> in three dimensions. Now, if we look at what the point points were, we have the origin, we have the one zero, and we have the zero one, and the intersection between that and the paraboloid and this and the paraboloid and the corresponding volume there, there, and there. So essentially it's a triangle in the xy plane that rises and cuts a segment out of the paraboloid. And we are integrating uh, over this triangle to get the volume that is circumscribed by the triangle, the three Cartesian axis and the paraboloid estimate. Okay, so let us do that uh, if we have an integral. So in here, when we put the limits, we will see that this x goes from 0 to 1, from 0 to 1, x, and then y, as we already discussed in here, goes from 0 to 1 minus x, uh, 0 to 1 minus x, y, and then x squared plus y squared. Alternatively, we could have started with y and then 
when we integrate over y from 0 to 1, we would have had an inner integral with respect to x, and it would have been from 0 to 1 minus 1. Uh, but of course the answer shouldn't change because the whole thing is symmetric with respect to rotation and therefore the permutation of the coordinates. Okay, so the outer integral here, uh, the inner integral is with respect to y, so this will be uh, x squared y plus y cubed over y. Three. And then an integral from 0 to 1 dx. And that inside of it will have limits from 0 to 1 minus x with respect to y. So substitute y equals 1 minus x, substitute y equals 0, integral from 0 to 1, then y equals 1 minus x, so x squared 1 minus x, plus <coughs> 1 minus x cubed 3, minus this term is 0 is 0, that term is 0 is 0, so nothing, x, and we are left with just the usual one-dimensional integral here that you can easily take. So after a bit of mathematics, this goes to 1 over 6. Now, your handout actually has integration in reverse order, where I have y as the outer integration variable and x as the inner integration variable, uh, but of course the answer is supposed to remain the same. Okay, so here we have a relatively simple geometric region over which we are integrating. Let us go to a more complicated region where we will be struggling in trying to determine it. So, next example. We are again integrating a two-dimensional function, but over the area that is bounded by two curves. f of x, y is, I think it's x squared, y squared, and then the area is between y equals x and y equals x squared. Now it really helps to first draw this in two dimensions. So here somewhere x, y, y equals x is this, y equals x squared is that. You know that x squared intersects with x at 1, 1. So an appropriate set of integration limits in here would be from 0 to 1 with respect to x. And then from x squared to x with respect to y. And then the function we are dealing with is x squared plus y squared. Now we can move to three dimensions, and the picture of this function uh, resembles a falling cloth. So, draw it like that, and then we can put the integration volume um, around and see what it is that we are actually um, integrating. Again, drawing a view to assist us with the painting. And then, if you look at this, again, for any fixed value of x, it's a parabola with respect to y, and for any fixed value of y, it's a parabola with respect to x, but whereas that was additive, this one's multiplicative, and so everywhere where x is 0, we must have a 0, unlike that, and everywhere where y is 0, we must have Zero, so it has a parabolic sides uh, on all four sides in here. And then <coughs> right. And so So 
up. You get the idea. And so now we will take a look at our integration region. Uh, and that will be the volume that is cut by this function here and the area that we have just drawn. So if this is our x, that's our y, and this is our f of x, y, then the corresponding volume will be when we move this from that plot onto the x, y plane there. So that will be the straight line in the x, y plane. And then the quadratic curve in the same x, mm -hmm. y plane, so this. And so it will be the volume that's cut by this little area as the bottom, rising up until it intersects with this curve, and then cutting the little bit out of it. And so that, a little, um, what you can pair it with, uh, a cucumber slice of something is what we are seeking. Okay, so the whole process um, is, I would describe it as follows. You are given a description of the integration region in either two or three dimensions. If you are dealing with a three-dimensional integral, you can only draw the integration volume one not the function. The function maps into something else, for example, temperature distribution inside that volume. If you are given a two-dimensional integration region, you can draw the region itself on a two-dimensional plot and then have a reasonable goal at visualizing the kind of volume uh, that you are trying to integrate um, and obtain the volume of when you proceed. So let us finish that integral over here. Integrating this with respect to y, to reduce integral from 0 to 1 dx and then x squared y cubed over 3 from y equals x squared to y equals x. Substituting that in integral 0 to 1 dx. And then on the upper limit it's just x, so get x to the fifth over 3 minus uh, x squared, so this will be x to the sixth, x to the eighth over 3. Integrating this now with respect to x, that will be x to the sixth over 18 minus x to the 9 <coughs> over 27, and that goes from 0 to 1. So that's 1 over 18 minus 1 over 27, uh, 1 over 54, apparently, if my friend out is to be uh, believed here. Maybe I've made some arithmetical mistakes here, but uh, you get the idea. Right? So arithmetic is simple and sequential here. Uh, okay, so the summary is multiple integrals, at least in Cartesian coordinates. Uh, it's much more complicated in polar coordinates and spherical ones, as we shall see in the next lecture. But for now, multiple integrals in Cartesian coordinates are just taken by putting one foot in front of the other and integrating with respect to one variable whilst assuming that the other variable is constant, like shown in there. More complicated things happen when your integration domain is not square, in which case it would have been numbers, but between one curve and another curve, in which case the upper and the lower limit of the inner integral might be a function of the outer integration variable. 
And there, when you are given a geometric description, your first job is to translate it into the functional description and to take these various elements on, at which point you proceed exactly as you have proceeded in there. Uh, a certain amount of painting skills are required, which, as you can see, is <coughs> very lack. Um, but um, for every case, in your ability to draw pretty pictures. Uh, and um, that's all I have to say. Any questions? Thank you.